the Khwarezm Empire. Now there was a place that was something to behold. Back in its prime, it stood as a true jewel of the Islamic world, brimming with wealth, wisdom, and culture. It wasn't just about riches either. They were thinkers, scholars, and builders of ideas that still echo into our time. Why, even the algorithms leading you to this very story can trace their roots back to this empire. But, as a fate would have it, one single decision sent it all crashing down. So, what happened? Settle in, and let me tell you how an empire, once destined for greatness, lost it all. The Khwarezm region, centered around the capital city of Urgench, has long stood at a historic crossroads, east of the Aral and Caspian Seas, in what is now Uzbekistan. Known as Khwarezm since at least the 10th century AD, and possibly even earlier, stretching back to the Sassanid Persian era, this area boasts a rich legacy. In ancient times, it served as a link between the vast steppes and settled lands, where its unique geography and diverse cultural influences fostered a distinct civilization. The earliest recorded inhabitants were steppe nomads, like the Huns, Sarmatians, and Sogdians, who roamed the land in the first few centuries AD, alongside the growing Persian and Islamic cultures that were beginning to take hold. By the 10th century, Khwarezm had become part of the Islamic Ghaznavid dynasty marking its ascent as a key strategic region within the Islamic world. This change laid the groundwork for Khwarezm's rise in the following centuries, eventually bringing it under the Seljuk Sultanate's control. In 1077, the Seljuks appointed Anush Tigin Garchai, a Turkish Mamluk, a slave soldier who had proved his loyalty and skill on the battlefield, as the governor of the region. Mamluks, or Ghulams as they were called in Persia, were a unique military class in the Islamic world. Typically, these were young boys from Turkish nomadic tribes who were enslaved, converted to Islam, and trained intensely in the Firusiya, or art of war. With this rigorous training, they became the backbone of Islamic armies, forming elite units of heavy cavalry. Anush Tegan's loyalty and prowess earned him this prestigious role in Khwarezm, and his lineage would go on to rule the region, laying the foundation for the Khwarezmian dynasty. For nearly a century, Khwarezm under the descendants of Anush Tegan functioned as a semi-independent state of the Seljuks, holding on to some autonomy while still pledging loyalty to the Seljuk sultans. This delicate arrangement faced a major test in 1141, when a combined seljuk khwarezmian army suffered a crushing defeat against the Kara Katai, a Central Asian empire led by Yeludashi. As a result, Khwarezm was forced to become a tributary state to the Kara Katai, beginning a challenging period of balancing between larger regional powers. The death of the Seljuk Sultan Ahmad Sanjar in 1156 threw the Seljuk Sultanate into chaos, creating an opportunity for Khwarezm to expand its power and autonomy. Ilarslan, who succeeded his father Allah ad-Din Aziz as ruler in 1156, was a capable leader who deftly navigated the unstable political landscape. Under his rule, Khwarezm established itself as both a frontier state and a formidable military power. His son, Allah ad-Din Takash, carried this momentum forward, launching ambitious campaigns that bolstered Khwarezm's influence. By the 1190s, the Khwarezmian cavalry had gained a fearsome reputation, earning respect and fear throughout Central Asia for its skill in mounted warfare. Allah ad-Din Takash's victories over both the Kara Kitai and the declining Seljuk Sultanate marked Khwarezm's transformation from a client state to an independent kingdom. The victory in 1194 that killed the Seljuk Sultan Togrul III effectively marked the end of Seljuk dominance in the region, allowing Khwarezm to assert itself as a sovereign power. Takash's military campaigns extended Khwarezm's influence, and by the end of the 12th century, it had grown into a powerful state known for its elite heavy cavalry, which was celebrated across the Islamic world for its skill and effectiveness in battle. In 1200, Allah ad-Din Takash passed the torch to his son, Allah ad-Din Muhammad. He saw the Seljuk Empire breaking apart and seized the chance, grabbing up vast stretches from the mountains of present-day Afghanistan to the Black Sea by 1205. Shah Muhammad adopted the title of Khwarezm Shah, King of Khwarezm, symbolizing the emergence of a powerful, independent state in Central Asia. He managed to unite bustling Persian cities with the fierce nomadic Turkic tribes, creating a diverse but united kingdom with a strong military and administrative system. Khwarezm's golden age wasn't just any run-of-the-mill moment in history. 
This empire stood shoulder to shoulder with the world's most advanced societies, and even managed to set standards that other empires wouldn't reach for another hundred years or more. What really set Khwarezm apart was the way they blended the rich scholarly traditions of Persia with the practical, battle-ready spirit of the Turkic tribes. Just take a look at some of the Persian art from the early 13th century, and you'll find stunning depictions of the Khwarezmian cavalry. Those artworks highlight their militarized culture and how vital their army was for both defending and expanding their power. Take literacy, for example. While much of the world was still struggling with low literacy rates, Khwarezm was thriving. They had high literacy across the board, not just among the nobility, but also among everyday folks. The need to read the Quran sparked a wave of intellectual and cultural development that truly set them apart from the rest. While much of Europe was busy dusting off ancient texts, Khwarezmian scholars were translating and expanding upon works of medicine, astronomy, and mathematics that are still referenced in some form today. Their scholars mastered advanced algebra and trigonometry centuries before many in the West even caught on. Take the work of Al-Khwarizmi, a renowned mathematician from Khwarezm. Before his time, problem-solving relied heavily on geometric diagrams and proofs, a method effective for practical applications but limited for abstract equations. In his groundbreaking text, Al-Kitab al-Mukhtasar fi Hisab al-Jabr wal-Muqabala, the compendious book on calculation by completion and balancing, Al-Khwarizmi unraveled this tangled web by creating systematic approaches for solving equations, like balancing terms, al-Jabr and al-Muqabala, completing the square, and classifying equation types, essentially laying down the core framework for algebra. When his work was translated into Latin in the 12th century, it became a foundational reference throughout medieval Europe. More than just providing algebra, Al-Khwarizmi equipped humanity with tools of logic and problem-solving, enabling innovation and exploration. The very word algebra derived from al-Jabr, one of his terms, and algorithm, which powers every calculation and every bit of code running today's technology, originates from his name, a lasting tribute to his legacy of bringing order and logic to a chaotic world. Khwarezmian scholars mastered trigonometry for astronomy, creating star charts that gave them a navigational edge over others, still using coastlines and landmarks. It was like having a secret weapon in a world where many were still fumbling about, trying to find their way by following coastlines or using rudimentary landmarks that often led to confusion and delays. This skill allowed the Shah to expand his empire along the Silk Road, setting up trade routes and moving troops efficiently. They also produced superior steel for weaponry, blending iron and carbon with advanced techniques, making their swords and armor stronger than their rivals. Their textiles were renowned for softness, durability, and vibrant colors, patterns woven so well they'd last ages, while their glass, clear and flawless, became prized across the Islamic world. In the end, it was that remarkable blend of advanced knowledge and superior products that really elevated Khwarezm's status, playing a crucial role in their economic and military successes during their golden age. Yet, here we are, left with a tragic mystery, We'll never truly know how they crafted those beautiful fabrics or produced such crystal clear glass. Nor will we ever fully understand how the Shah managed to govern this diverse and vast empire, or just how wealthy and cultured they really were. We can only ponder the advancements in science, art, and philosophy that could have reshaped the world in ways we can barely begin to imagine. And all this loss? It came crashing down because the entire country, yes, a whole country, collapsed under the relentless horse steps of the Mongols. That Mongol invasion swept through like a furious storm, tearing apart cities and armies alike. It didn't just take lives, it obliterated the vast reservoir of knowledge and culture that the Khwarezmians had painstakingly built over centuries. Libraries filled with precious texts, schools alive with eager scholars sharing ideas, and vibrant marketplaces bustling with trade. All of it turned to rubble. And you know what's particularly tragic? All of this devastation stemmed from the decisions of one man, the very Shah who raised this empire. Khwarezm had its vulnerabilities, largely due to the tangled web of internal and external politics. The Shah had just consolidated power over various regions, but he was also facing mounting tensions with the Caliph of Baghdad, An-Nasir. Now, this Shah wasn't one to bow down. 
he rejected the caliph's authority, insisting on being recognized as the independent sultan of his empire without paying tribute to anyone. This bold stance strained his southern borders, right where the Mongol Empire was expanding. An-Nasir saw an opportunity in this tension and tried to stir up trouble between Khwarezmia and the Mongols to undermine the Shah's power. There are some intriguing stories floating around that the Caliph actually sent a secret message to Genghis Khan, urging him to take aim at the Khwarezmian Sultan. One tale, though it may sound a bit far-fetched, claims that a messenger had a message tattooed on his head and managed to slip through Khwarezm undetected, reaching Mongol lands with the Caliph's plea. Another story suggests that the Caliph even offered Genghis Khan a gift of Crusader prisoners, showing how some Muslim leaders were willing to side with the Mongols against their rivals. By 1219, Genghis Khan, nearly 60 and at the height of his power, had secured his Mongol Empire's prosperity and relative peace. Juvaini, a historian, describes this time as one of absolute peace, security, and tranquility where Genghis Khan seemed prepared to enjoy his later years in peace, content with the empire's wealth and stability. Following the Mongol conquest of the Karakitan state, Genghis Khan's Mongol empire extended right up to the borders of the Khwarezmian empire. You might think Genghis Khan was itching for a fight, what with all his conquests, but historians generally agree he wasn't looking to invade Khwarezmia right off. He had his hands full battling the Jin dynasty and the Western Jia in northern China. And believe it or not, he saw a peaceful trade relationship with Khwarezmia as a far better option than conflict. Historians tell us he wasn't keen on stretching his forces too thin. Why would he want to start another fight when there was money to be made? So the Khan decided to send a friendly diplomatic letter to the Shah of Khwarezm, addressing him as the Sultan of the land where the sun sets, and proposed a treaty of peace and friendship. In that letter, he expressed his desire to live in harmony, saying, I will regard you as my son. You may not know that I have conquered northern China and subdued all northern tribes. My country is a land of warriors, a mine of silver, and I have no need to seize other lands. We both benefit equally from strengthening trade between our people. Now, that's quite a pitch, isn't it? But we gotta say, that son part? That probably didn't sit well, especially with a Shah who had already rejected the Caliph's authority. Although the Shah was initially cautious about the Mongol proposal due to their fearsome reputation, he ultimately accepted it. His advisor Mahmud Yalvach managed to prevent the situation from escalating, smoothing things over, and securing a trade agreement. This was a pragmatic choice. Both empires had much to gain, as trade between Central Asia and China promised exceptional wealth. Genghis Khan, pleased with this development, sent a caravan of 500 Muslim merchants along with a Mongol envoy to the Khwarezmian city of Otrar, which is now in southern Kazakhstan. Since the Mongols weren't traders themselves, Genghis relied on Muslim and Hindu merchants from the recently acquired Uyghur territory. However, Inalchuk, the governor of Otrar, seized all the goods and killed the merchants, suspecting them of espionage, or perhaps just out of pure greed. Only one merchant managed to escape and deliver the grim news to Genghis Khan. In response, Genghis Khan displayed remarkable restraint. He dispatched a second delegation of three envoys, one Muslim and two Mongols, to Shah Muhammad, seeking an explanation, requesting the release of the merchants, and demanding punishment for Inalchuk. However, Shah Muhammad viewed the Mongol request as an insult and retaliated by executing the Muslim envoy and shaving the heads of the two Mongol envoys before sending them back. His anger was fueled by a broader atmosphere of mutual suspicion. Reports from Khwarezmian emissaries in Beijing exaggerated the Mongols' brutality, recounting tales of slaughter from their wars against the Jin, which only deepened the Shah's distrust. Frequent arguments with his mother, who held nearly as much power as he did, added to his turmoil. The threat of a Mongol invasion intensified their disagreements over everything from governance to military preparedness. Ironically, her brother was the one who had detained the Mongol caravan, igniting the conflict, yet she refused to let her son punish him, which only escalated hostilities. To make matters worse, Shah Muhammad ordered the execution of the detained merchants. For Genghis Khan, this affront was simply unacceptable. To him, envoys were sacred and inviolable and such disrespect was an unforgivable provocation. Thus, Genghis Khan mobilized 200,000 troops, 
including his four sons and four of his most trusted generals, to launch a catastrophic invasion that would obliterate the Khwarezmian Empire. The Shah stationed his main army in Samarkand and dispersed other units across fortified positions along the Sir Daria and in Transoxiana, but this left his 400,000 troops scattered and unable to act as a unified force. He feared consolidating them under one commander might lead to rebellion, a fear that stemmed from the internal royal tensions and the loyalty issues among his soldiers. Underestimating the Mongols' siege skills was a crucial mistake. He believed his fortified cities would be safe from attack. In places like Bukhara and Samarkand, where locals had seen countless invaders come and go, the Mongols were just another tribal threat at first. Historically, well-supplied defenders behind strong walls had been able to hold out against even the fiercest tribal armies. But the Mongols were different. Genghis Khan had gathered intelligence, mainly through spies along the Silk Road, and he meticulously organized his forces. They came equipped with new siege technology. Battering rams, gunpowder, trebuchets, flaming oil pots, and massive crossbows with arrows up to five meters long. To maximize their chances of success, the Mongols timed their desert crossing for the coldest months of the year. This strategy helped them conserve water for both soldiers and horses, while promoting grass growth for their animals, and attracting game for food. Instead of dragging bulky siege engines with them, they brought skilled craftsmen who could quickly build whatever they needed from local materials. One of Genghis Khan's armies made its way directly from Mongolia through the rugged Fervarna Valley aiming for the Shah's eastern frontier. The Shah had expected an invasion through the Dzungarian Gate, the most accessible route, but Genghis Khan had a bold plan. He chose the riskier path through the Tian Shan Mountains, avoiding direct confrontation until he had the upper hand. At the same time, he secretly deployed a second detachment along an unprecedented and arduous route. By forming alliances with local nomads, this force traversed the desolate Dzungarian Mountains traveling over 2,000 miles of harsh desert, shifting sands, and scorching heat to infiltrate deep into the Shah's rear defenses. The Shah felt confident that the formidable Kaizilkum Desert would protect his borders, assuming no army would dare to cross its legendary dangers. Little did he know, the Mongols were about to turn that very isolation into their greatest advantage. Between 1220 and 1221, Genghis Khan led devastating campaigns across Khwarezm's Khorasan region, leaving once thriving cities in ruins. Each defeated city had its own unique story with slightly different developments, but the outcome was always the same. The Mongol campaign left no city unscathed. Resistance was met with brutal reprisals, and the social structure of the Khwarezmian Empire was systematically dismantled. Genghis Khan utilized the high literacy rates among the Islamic population, transforming unsuspecting foes into powerful tools for shaping public sentiment through propaganda. Recognizing that fear was best instilled not by warriors but by the pens of scholars and chroniclers, he orchestrated a campaign of terror that leveraged exaggerated accounts of Mongol brutality. Written accounts became the most effective weapon in Genghis Khan's arsenal for instilling fear among the people of Khwarezm, leading them to surrender easily or lose their will to fight. Those who resisted faced execution, while those who surrendered were often slaughtered for their perceived treachery. Women and children were enslaved, and men conscripted into the military. Skilled artisans like blacksmiths and carpenters were absorbed into the Mongol workforce, while unskilled survivors were frequently forced to the front lines as human shields in subsequent battles. The wealthy were annihilated, and livestock was slaughtered, leaving behind devastated communities. The systematic massacre of the nobility dismantled the social structure of the conquered, rendering many cities incapable of recovery, particularly after their elite were lost on the battlefield or executed. In Otrar, for instance, after a prolonged five-month siege, Mongol forces breached the city walls but delayed their final assault for a month, hoping to capture Governor Inalchuk alive. When captured, he was gruesomely executed, with molten silver poured into his mouth, ears, and eyes. In Bukhara, a city revered in Islamic spirituality, Genghis Khan delivered a chilling proclamation, asserting, O oh people, know that you have committed great sins. If you had not committed great sins, God would not have sent a punishment like me upon you. I am the punishment of God. 
This ominous message resonated throughout the region, particularly in Nishapur, where a revolt triggered a brutal massacre in retaliation for the death of Genghis Khan's son-in-law, Tokuchar. His demand for the heads of the slain to be stacked in towers illustrated the extent of his vengeance. Genghis Khan's personal tragedies, including the death of his grandson Mutagan in Bamiyan, intensified his wrath, resulting in a relentless campaign of total annihilation across the valley. Soldiers and local militias attempted to resist the Mongols but failed to halt or even slow their murderous advance. With the policy of not even sparing dogs and cats, Genghis Khan not only annihilated the entire Khwarezmian Empire, but also left behind mountains of corpses in the cities he passed through in this Islamic Empire. According to historical records, every Mongol soldier was tasked with executing over 100 people, or 350, with exaggerated numbers varying across different historical documents. Unsatisfied, Genghis Khan even diverted entire rivers in the Khwarezmian territory to completely erase this nation from the map of humanity. Towns were pillaged and burned as he sought to restructure the flow of goods in Central Asia, a large-scale and highly successful effort. By destroying cities along less significant or more challenging trade routes, he funneled commerce into areas easily monitored and controlled by his troops, obliterating entire cities down to the last brick to prevent goods from passing through unwanted regions. Some historians argue that the invasion of Khwarezm stands as the most brutal chapter in Mongol military history, culminating in a near-genocidal eradication of the Khwarezmian people. Shah La'ad-Din Muhammad II fled before Samarkand's fall in March 1220 and died shortly afterward on an island in the Caspian Sea. Months later, his son Jalal al-Din, just 20 and now Shah of the fractured Khwarezmian Empire, rallied the remaining army in Afghanistan achieving a decisive victory against a Mongol force. In response, Genghis Khan ordered Jalal al-Din's capture, but the Shah escaped to India with 5,000 cavalry, narrowly evading capture at the Indus River in 1221. There, he made a legendary escape, earning Genghis Khan's admiration. Fortunate should be the father of such a son. When some of his warriors wanted to pursue Jalal al-Din, Genghis Khan held them back, wisely cautioning that the prince would defeat all of their attempts. Jalal al-Din spent his last decade in India, ultimately meeting his end at the hands of bandits. His family suffered a tragic fate. Many were executed, and his mother, along with surviving relatives, was exiled to a life of servitude in Mongolia, marking the empire's sorrowful end.